Morning, everybody. Steve Parisi here with IBC Global. Hope that you are having a good day. So for today, we have a guest with us, uh, Scott Witt. And Scott, uh, to me just give him a little bit of an introduction, is what I would consider one of the experts out there in the field of cash value life insurance. Uh, so he is the president of Witt Actuarial Services, um, a great resource. Uh, I've learned a lot from him, his website as well, just from uh, our interaction uh, recently. But uh, Scott, thanks so much for uh, for coming on today. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, certainly. No, glad we could could do this. So, Scott, today, you know, always talking about life insurance and you know my company's role, which you know, which is teaching people how to maximize cash value life insurance. We'll get into some of that, but mainly wanted everyone to kind of get to know you, what you do, your expertise. Uh, so before I, I start asking you, asking you some questions, if if you can start just with a, a background of yourself, you know, what is it that you do? If you want to go into a little bit what you went, went to school for, what you've done for a long time. And uh, if you'd like to start there, that'd be great. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, I'm an actuary by training. Um, I still maintain the highest uh, designations. I'm a fellow of the Society of Actuaries and a member of the American Academy of Actuaries. So that's what I went to school for um, after I got my undergraduate degree. Um, I'm, my background was in math and computer science, and then I got a master's degree in statistics. And it was while I was there at Oregon State getting my master's that I began to find out what the actuarial profession was all about. And I realized it was a great combination of the different things that interested me already. And while I was finishing up my master's degree, I started taking actuarial exams. And then that led me uh, to Northwestern Mutual, where I worked for 10 years, uh, primarily in the actuarial department there. And around 19, or, or, or around 2005, um, I began to yearn for something else, something that was more entrepreneurial in nature. And at that time, uh, I left to join a gentleman named Peter Cott, uh, who was one of the, the nation's only fee-only insurance advisors. And I, I joined him and realized pretty quickly that it's hard to scratch an entrepreneurial itch if you're the number two person uh, in a two-person shop. So within a couple of years, uh, I had broken off and started my own company. And ever since 2007, uh, I've been running with actuarial services. Gotcha. Wow. So about 13 years now, you're in your 14th year. Gotcha. So what you mentioned there, I've got a, a question. I, I haven't asked you this before, and this just kind of intrigues me with, with what my background was. So the exams that you have to take to actually become an actuary, how, I'm curious, how intensive is that? Like how, how much work goes into studying and then how many exams do you have to take? What kind of what's the process there? <laughs> sure. It, it, it is definitely a process. Um, I think it's one of those things too, that whatever it's changed a lot over the years. And I think it's one of those things that whatever you went through, you think was the hardest, you know? So if you talk to any of the old timers, whatever exam system they went through, that was as hard as it possibly could be. And it's super easy now. Um, the, real the reality is they're all pretty hard. Um, when I went through, uh, I believe I ended up passing 22 or 23 exams. Um, what probably was the most difficult is that a lot of them were only offered once a year. And I mean, you talk about pressure, and, and it was really a pass fail. They scored them from, I think, one through 10 and you needed to get a six or higher. But if you got the dreaded five, um, you were almost there, but you had to wait an entire year to take the test again. And so it, it's not uncommon to find people that never make it through the exam process or that get stalled out right at the end or near the end. And it may take uh, it may take many, many years to complete the exam process. So even if everything goes well, you're looking at, at probably a five-year uh, process, best case scenario. And I'd say on average, it's it's much longer than that. Wow. Yeah. No, that, that's certainly a process. And then Northwestern, I mean, nobody needs to say anything about them. We're talking about cream of the crop as far as several insurance companies out there. They've Their insurance products are stellar. I mean, they're one of the top companies. So becoming an actuary and having to work, getting a chance to work for them. I'd, I'd imagine, I wouldn't know the answer to this, but I'd imagine getting a job for one of the top companies is not easy <laughs> initially. Yeah. You know, in, in, in retrospect, I was really lucky. Um, I didn't know, 
I really didn't know one company from another. And I really was only familiar with Northwestern Mutual because my brother happened to be an agent at the time. Um, he no longer uh, is a life insurance agent. He's a, he's a financial planner, but he said, you know, it, it's a really great company. What I've subsequently learned is that every agent would say the same thing about their company. Every company is a really great company, but it, in, in this case, I was fortunate that he, he was right. And so I, I had never even been to Wisconsin until I came out for my job interview. And then the second time I came to Wisconsin was when I moved out here for the job. So it, it really was a shot in the dark. And the, then lo and behold, to, to, to really find out that it was one of the premier companies, um, probably one of the best lessons I learned from them just was the way that they did, um, that, that, that they went about their business. I mean, they really talked a good game about looking out for the policyholder and, you know, we're owned by the policyholders, but more than the talk, they actually walk the walk. And so um, no company is perfect, um, but I've, I thought that they consistently demonstrated uh, a desire to do right by the policyholder. And it, there's no doubt it's a really good company. Yeah, I, I'd agree. I mean, that's, uh, I started there just in my role, more of the analytical side and designing policies for corporations. And I, I got that sense all the way through before I decided to do what you did and kind of go the pure entrepreneur out and independent. But yeah, only only good things to say about them. Gotcha. Well, thanks thanks for, for going to your background a little bit there. And, you know, the main question I have uh, for you is what is a fee-only life insurance advisor? Life insurance advisor, because Everyone knows what a financial advisor is. You've got insurance agents. You know, these are people that sell financial products, whether it's life insurance, investments, whatever it might be. But a fee-only life insurance advisor, like that's that's your niche. That's what you do, what your company primarily focuses on, right? It is. And and you're right. It, it, it is very rare. There's probably only a handful of people or firms in the country that truly are fee only insurance advisors. So, you know, I think a lot of people hear that concept and they just sort of brush over it and they think that it, it's fairly common, but it is important to understand what that means and, and what makes it so special. Um, and the, the fact that I am fee only is really what sets me apart. And the most important thing to take away there is that I don't have any conflicts of interest. When somebody hires me, I exclusively am looking out for their best interests. It makes no difference to me if they buy a product, what kind of product, who they buy it from, how much. Uh, everything I do is on their behalf. And I try to put myself in the client's shoes and give them the kind of advice that, that I would want if I were similarly situated. And because of that, there's a high degree of trust. My clients know that I'm not, I'm not trying to gain their trust so that I can sell them something, you know, a trust me type of situation at the end of a sales process. And we're able to get right to the heart of the matter. Um, I'm only paid on an hourly or a project fee basis. I don't get any sort of kickbacks. Um, I do need to work with agents if 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 the client cannot purchase the policy directly from the company, and that's that's a very rare situation that they can. So there is almost always some kind of agent involved. But I make it very clear to all involved that I don't have any sort of financial incentive to refer business to any particular uh, vendor. And that allows me to serve my clients in a true fiduciary capacity. Uh, the word fiduciary you know, is getting thrown around more and more these days. But in, in my view, the model that I have allows me to be more of a fiduciary, if you will, than many others out there that are, that are claiming the same. And then at the end of the process, put on a salesperson's hat and end up getting sales commission for the thing that they supposedly gave independent advice about. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Gotcha. No, th thanks for going going into that. I mean, what what I would like to ask, what I'm what I'm interested in is because how you and I, when we first crossed paths, I call it, it was several years ago, and you may remember this. It was someone we were working with, um, sharp guy. He was talking to us and a couple other. Uh, financial advisors and insurance agents. He was looking at cash value life insurance. He wanted to know how do I maximize the cash value, different companies, flexibility, all that good stuff, which I love going into. And he, he, I remember he sent me an email. He goes, hey, I know we're, I'm talking to you and, and a couple other groups as well. I've reached out to a fee-only insurance advisor. And I'm kind of like, 
I didn't, I hadn't heard the term before. So I'm like, okay, I'm not sure what that is. Um, but then he tied you into the email communication, going back and forth. And I was most, uh, I'll use the word impressed because I hadn't seen it from anyone in the insurance business before, just with the attention to detail and the thoroughness as far as how you were advising him. I mean, everything was perfect. I mean, we, when I say perfect, we designed policies to maximize cash value. It's what he was after. So you were working with him to help him accomplish that goal. But the detail orientation, I love that stuff, attention to detail, was laid out so beautifully. I'm like, wow, I mean, this is like perfect here. The guy knows exactly how he should set up a policy. He'd been working with you, but that's how you and I had first crossed paths. And I forget how many years ago, that was like four or five years ago or something like that. Um, but, it, you know, my, my question would be just, I think more recently, just over the past three or four years, technology's technology. It makes information so easy to obtain for, for a consumer. And some information could be great. Some information might not be the best information. So as there's so much information out there on life insurance products and such, and you've got me telling, hey, someone we're working with, here's the best way to design a policy, different companies, you've got 18 other agents saying, here's why you want to do it this way. I guess my question is, any call it frontline stories or as you've worked with people, how have you been able to help them? They came to you saying, hey, I'm looking at this policy and then in working with you, their value was just brought up so exponentially high as a result of your services and your company. Sure. Well, there, you know, there's lots of different, as you can imagine, there's lots of different types of cases. And, you know, we're focused on life insurance in our discussion today, but I, I do also consult on annuities and long-term care insurance. But specifically within the life insurance arena, there are a lot of different ways that somebody like me can add value. Um, probably the lowest hanging fruit is through policy design, um, taking advantage of, of underlying actuarial principles to help optimize a policy, but then taking it the next step and understanding that in many situations with cash value policies, there is commission flexibility. And so it is not uncommon, uh, and, and you know this, it, it, it's, it's very common for a cash value life insurance policy to have a zero cash value for the first year or sometimes even more. And many people within the industry, you know, whether it be consumers or financial planners or estate planning attorneys, they just think that's the cost of doing business. If I'm gonna get a life insurance policy, it's gonna have a zero cash value for a year and it might take 12 or 15 years before the cash value breaks even with the sum of the premiums paid. And as you know, we can do far better than that. If you're willing to optimize the policy on behalf of the client and sacrifice uh, a substantial amount of agent compensation, you can have a first year cash value that is 85 or 90% of the first year premium in many situations. And instead of a break even year of 12 or 15, you might be looking at a break even year of four, five, six years. And basically every dollar you're taking out of the agent's pocket, you're putting into the policyholder's policy. And not only that, but on a present value basis, every dollar you take away from the agent is actually worth more than a dollar in the policyholder's hands because early cash values um, enable you to, to lower the future mortality charges that are going to be assessed within many of the policy designs. And so long story short, um, if, if, if we had a mutual client that had that came to us, let's say, with annual premiums of $20,000 and their first year cash value was originally illustrated to be zero, I'm fairly confident that through design, we could deliver a first year cash value of upwards of $16,000. And that is an immediate savings of $16,000. But on a present value basis, that client is probably saving more like twenty-three dollars or $24,000 and when you compare that with the project or the hourly fee that I charged, it, it is a massive benefit to cost ratio and one that frankly makes sense for almost any person that's buying a cash value policy. 
I agree with that a hundred percent. Kind of a, a side side note, it, my mindset just around paying for for help, call it. So if I'm going to pay you as an advisor or a business coach, if you were to talk to me five years ago, what would the term be? Cheap, tight water? Like I don't want to spend the money. You know, I'll, I'll figure it figure it out on my own. I'll learn it myself. And just the value in hiring someone regardless of what they charge because they're the expert there they've got the knowledge and paying them it saves me as a business owner so much time where i don't have to learn about whatever topic it is maybe it's cash value life insurance got to learn all the details pay the expert they're going to save me all the time and the monetary value will be there too in a case like you just mentioned but i i could not agree with that more i mean i view whenever there's a business decision and it's something hey can this individual for hiring attorney or, or whoever it might be can they help accelerate speed time if the answer is yes i view it kind of like buying time like all right go all in so i can get to where i want to be in 10 years in a year instead of having to wait 10 years to get there <laughs> right well what's what what i've what i've seen over the years and i've been doing this a long time is that unfortunately there are many people that would rather pay that $20,000 agent compensation in that example I just gave and be unaware of it than pay me a few thousand dollars up front and, and be, you know, $17,000 better off uh, net position. Like there, there is a resistance to, play, to, to paying a transparent fee up front, yet oddly enough, an acceptance of paying a much higher uh, fee that that is hidden and built into the product, and so that's that's one of the biases that that I work to overcome. Um, the other thing I want to say is that, as I mentioned, that really is just the low hanging fruit. That that's the easiest part of what I do is is designing a policy to minimize agent compensation, and really that's the that's the baseline consideration that I look at whenever I'm looking at designing a policy for a client. So whatever the policy is, whatever. Uh, arena we're operating in, I'm always looking to put the client's best foot forward. As you know, life insurance is so complicated that in the grand scheme of things, expenses aren't even the most important aspect of a life insurance policy. You know, over the long haul, expenses are going to be dwarfed by the investment returns on the policy in, in most situations. And in most situations, the underlying mortality charges are also going to be more important over the over the long term life uh, of that policy. And so again, I expenses, while they're significant, that really is the low hanging fruit. And the one example that I give to people that 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 I, I think have a hard time comprehending this is, you know, I, I tell them about the commission piece and everybody gets excited about that. Like we can save money there. And I say, but to put this in perspective, you would actually be better off paying full commissions on a policy from an elite company than you would paying zero commissions on a policy from a poor company. Because the underlying fundamentals on the great company are that much more appealing than the underlying fundamentals on a poor company that it more than offsets the compensation difference. And so what I really try to get my clients to understand is that I'm focused on the long-term value proposition. And it is possible to win the compensation battle, if you will, but lose the long-term value war. And the, the, the value that I bring to the table is the knowledge or, and perspective to combine the best of both worlds. I am looking for superior underlying fundamentals packaged with optimal policy design. And you can't just focus on one or the other. You have to look at the entire package because of the complexity. Yeah, gotcha. No, great, great points. No, that, that's so interesting what you mentioned about the, the elite company as well, because I don't even have 1% of the knowledge and insight you do into the, the <laughs> insurance industry and cash value policies. But I definitely, I had some exposure to individuals that had a role in writing, not writing the software, but helping, they saw the formulas plugged into insurance company softwares to say, hey, when you actually design a policy for a corporation, you're maximizing the cash value. Here's why, Steve, you see such a net difference in net cash value 
between the base premium dollars and PUA dollars, you know, adding term riders, all that good stuff. So just kind of on the surface level, I sat there and tried to pick it apart and probably got 1% of it. But but anyway, as you mentioned that, it, it, it starts to line up more. I'm like, okay, what I, the one thing I know just from my role as that designer and then what we what we do today with individuals and companies is even before I talk to a company that's interested in cash value insurance, if it's for a SERP, whatever the product is, a lot of times before we even get anywhere, they're already talking about, hey, we're interested in certain insurance companies because they're well rated and maybe a, a CFO from another corporation came over. They already had those on the books products with certain companies that were well designed and they know it from experience and experience is huge but what you just mentioned lines up with that as well it's yeah i, I get fascinated with this stuff which you already know that well and I, I think i mean I have, I have an interesting observation there too um you know obviously all of the things being equal people want to have their policies with a highly rated insurance company and and i understand that but in in the arena of cash value life insurance it's actually a balancing act. You know, it is possible to be an insurance company that hoards surplus and doesn't share it with policyholders. And you might be able to demonstrate to insurance regulators that there is no chance that your company is ever going to be in financial trouble because you haven't shared the value with your policyholders. And so like with anything, um, some prudence is required there as well. You, you can't make all of your decisions solely on the basis of company financial strength ratings, because as a policyholder, yes, you want security, but you also, if you're if you're purchasing from from a mutual company, let's say, you also want to share in the divisible surplus. So you want the company to operate fairly and share with its policyholders the surplus that they have earned. And so that that's just an interesting observation that I've had over the years, um, and again, an example of when you only focus on one thing, like focusing on minimizing compensation or focusing on maximizing the insurance company rating, you aren't always going to have an optimal outcome. You have to look at the, the, the big picture and balance all of these different objectives together. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. No, I appreciate that, that information. And obviously, I mean, we can talk about so many topics, whether it's just policy design, which obviously is always a popular topic with everyone that, that our company works with. Um, but I just, I know you and I have had conversations around other areas in the insurance field. I mean, you've got the whole topic of indexed universal life, you know, pros and cons, how do they actually work, which we'll certainly, you know, can talk about in detail in the future. If you, if you ever have anything you want to add on that too, feel free to chime right in. <laughs> I know we've had some great calls on that. <laughs> yeah, that, it, it, we might need a whole series of podcasts to tackle indexed universal life. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And I mean, I always try and look at it and like, okay, whether it's insurance or if I'm going to buy, you know, I'm looking at different, different types of vehicles to buy. This is how my mind works. And I'm strange in this way. I take a step back. What are the pros and cons? Let me measure it out and say, okay, does it make sense or does it not, not make sense? Um, and do, do the same thing with whole life, IUL, all that good stuff. Um, but no, really today, just kind of for our first podcast, wanted to you know, have everyone get to know you uh, as far as your company, uh, with actuarial services. If anyone wants to get a hold of you, what's what's typically the best way to reach out to you? I know you've got a website, but what are some great ways to, to get in contact with you? Yeah, probably my website uh, is the best way. And it's just witactuarialservices.com. And there's a contact form on there where people can reach me. And that, that comes directly uh, to me. And uh, what, I, what I am willing to do if... Uh, people want to kick the tires a little bit. I'm willing to have a 10 or 15 minute call off the clock um, to see if their case uh, <clears throat> is a good situation. And I mean, let, let's face it, what, what, what I'm interested in are situations where I can look like a hero, where I can add value and the client is going to be happy at the end of the engagement, happy to pay my bill. So Early on, if I talk with somebody and it's not a good fit, or I can just give them some quick free advice and send them on their way, I will do that. I'm not interested in trying to milk an engagement uh, out of somebody that's not really a good fit 
for my services. And it's usually very, it's very apparent um, early on in a call whether or not I'm going to be able to add sufficient value uh, to justify my fees. Gotcha. Th fully agree. Yeah. And I've checked out your website. I've read a lot of your articles, which I, I really enjoy. And I mean, I'll, I'll let you know that I kind of did the same thing just from a, an agent standpoint. I'm not sure how many agents reach out to you on a regular basis. Um, but for years, you know, I learned how to design policies. You know, I, I got to dug, dig into the software, see historical performance. But just as we grew, you know, other companies do things differently. I'm like, okay, like how do I validate this? Because as an individual, and I've got a, a company and people that help me too, but typically you tend to be laser focused. You know, who's an expert I can kind of bring in from the outside that I can talk to to say, hey, here's how I do things. I want to hear from an expert, an actuary, and someone that has a, a nice laser focus, understands cash value, life insurance. There's not many many people out there that, that do what you do, that actually have the experience and everything. So in that, that conversation, just in talking to you, our initial call when I had reached out, um, I mean, I enjoyed it. And I could talk to you for forever about that kind of stuff, about how products work, their companies, how to max out cash values. But yeah, just having that call and getting that validation. Um, or if you're doing something wrong, there are a couple of areas that um, we disagreed a little bit on that you mentioned, like the guarantees and such, how to look at those, uh, which is so, so interesting. So, I mean, always trying to get as much knowledge as you can to make sure you're making the proper decision. You provide that. I mean, you get the information. And in my mind, after discussion with you, there's not going to be an area that's going to be left hanging. Oh, we forgot to touch on that. I mean, your thoroughness, when we first were informally introduced through that individual I was working with, was apparent in that email. I'm like, this is like when we train agents here on how to respond to individuals, I'm like, attention to detail. Do not leave anything out. I'm like, that. that's a perfect response right there that Scott gave me. <laughs> Well, and, and I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, you know, in, in terms of the knowledge that's out there among agents, I mean, I'll be the first to admit there are some agents out there that are really good people. There are agents out there that are really knowledgeable. This really has nothing to do with that. But you also have to acknowledge that there are some agents out there that are just beginning. Um, they've only been trained by their company. Um but what they, no, no matter how good of a person they are or not how knowledgeable they are, what is impossible to, to escape is that they have an inherent conflict of interest. And no amount of trust and no amount of knowledge should be able to um, cover that up in the eyes of the policyholder. And if a policyholder goes into a situation or you know a consumer goes into a situation with their eyes wide open, and they understand that that inherent conflict of interest exists, I think they have a lot better chance of having a favorable outcome. And what many sophisticated and educated buyers realize is the cost of my services is a very inexpensive insurance policy to make sure they don't make a big mistake with their expensive insurance policy. And you know, we talked about saving money as one of the things I can do, you know, through policy design and through minimizing agent compensation, but there are a lot of other ways I can add value. Company selection, um, even the type of policy, and it's it's very common for somebody to come to me contemplating a certain type of permanent life insurance, but then end up purchasing a different kind. And then the other thing I'd say too, which is is hard to put a price tag on, is I help clients avoid costly mistakes. And there are a lot of schemes out there in the insurance world. And unfortunately, many of them look uh, great on paper. And what our clients may find out if, if, if they don't engage us or these people that are thinking about engaging us, they may find out years down the road that what they're looking at was indeed too good to be true. And so I don't know how to capture what the savings are from preventing somebody from making a huge mistake, but clearly helping them prevent that puts them in a better situation than they otherwise would have been. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. No, and that goes back to kind of how I look at making business decisions. Like, would I spend a thousand, would I spend a hundred thousand dollars today to, not that you charge people a hundred thousand dollars, no, you don't do that. <laughs> but as a business owner, 
Would if I you find them, send them my way. <laughs> we'll do. <laughs> but if I'm going to spend $100,000 for my business just to obtain the knowledge in order to scale like Amazon or Apple does, so I can try and get all the inside you know, trades and secrets, everything that they do from a, a business standpoint, which I'm so interested in and always looking to do that, it, in my mind, it's the exact same thing with an insurance product. Why would I not spend if it's you know a few hundred dollars or whatever the... The amount comes out to just to make sure that it's set out set up 100 correctly me personally i'm all for that and it did take me a while as i mentioned before to develop that mindset it used to be cheap but now it's like hey when you look at how can i put it call it the one percent or companies and such they do not focus on hey how can i save all this money here it's how do i use the money to get the myself in the best possible position and move at light speed. So in my mind, it all ties together in that respect. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, agreed. Yeah. Well, you know, really appreciate you, you coming on. Um, again, if you want to find Scott, his website is certainly the, the best way. We've got that posted here um, on the video uh, and the, the, the link on this podcast as well. And appreciate everyone listening today. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Steve. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, Steve Parisi here. If you enjoyed the content you just saw, please subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell for future videos. If you'd like more information or to see some custom policies for yourself, feel free to call or email our offices at the contact information below.